You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, sponsored for September by Cedar Trail Gear. As luck would have it, I am Mighty Blue, and the show is all about celebrating the triumphs and sometimes the tragedies of hikers, all of whom have done or are about to do something they will never, ever forget. Funnily enough, this week on Facebook... I saw a comment from a woman responding to a post that asked who was going to through-hike the 18th next year. A lady called Anita replied, 50% yes for me, either I buy a new car or I use the money for a trip. Several of us replied, nobody suggested she buys a car. I said, Anita, a car will never change your life. An 80 through-hike most certainly will. And really, it's those life-changing hiking stories that we're bringing you. One such is of a young man who is halfway through his southbound hike. Christian Foster, or Bear, was suggested to me before he'd even started by his father. And yet there was something about the email that made me want to follow up with him, so Christian will be along shortly. Oh, and by the way, Anita, who I mentioned earlier, responded, Thanks, fellas, I just needed the reassurance. So she'll be out there in 2022. Go, Anita. We catch up with Katie this week in a Florida airport. Now... You may recognise a Florida airport as significantly off the trail. But don't worry, she's heading back to Maine and she pushes back on me when I suggest that she may lose the rhythm she'd gained recently. We're going to hear from Katie after Christian. Now, before we finish out the show with Winton Porter's book, Passing Through, this week, I had a short chat with Ryan McCormick, the inventor of the three-point multi tool. Talking of which... Now, we've all heard of Leave No Trace, and I hope that we all apply the principles, but sometimes... Let's face it, it is really difficult to dig a deep enough hole with those small plastic and metal trowels. Well, Cedar Trail Gear have come up with a solution, and like all good gear, their three-point multi-tool has several important functions for you and the hiker in your life. This ingenious device will not only easily dig your cat hole to the correct depth, it can be used as a pick to loosen up rocks and stones in your outdoor bathroom of choice. And you can even use it as a hammer to knock your stakes into hard ground when you set up camp. It's truly that strong. I've used it myself and it works like a dream. It weighs just 9 ounces, is made of very durable aluminum and is powder coated in highly visible safety orange. Check it out at cedartrailgear.com where you will learn of yet another surprising use for the 3-point multi-tool. As I say, Ryan will be on for a quick chat after Katie. So let's get on and meet Christian Foster, or Bear. Our guest today was suggested to me by his dad a few months ago. At that time, Christian Bear Foster hadn't started his Sobo hike. So I said to his dad, Jerry, that perhaps he should get back in touch with me when Christian got, I don't know, halfway. Well, I didn't know if I was going to hear from him again. But here's Christian. <laughs> nice, nice to hear from you, Bear. How are you? Wonderful. How you doing, Mighty Blue? I'm good. I'm good. Um, you certainly got a cheerleader in your dad, haven't you? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, that guy must love me or something. I don't know what his deal is. It could be. It, it could be. Yeah. And as I understand it, he and your mum have been coming to see you every now and then. And right now, you've made it all the way to Boiling Springs. I suppose the quick question is, and we're going to go into it more, obviously. But how's it going so far? Oh, it's been amazing. I. Um... You know, it's 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 certainly not lost on me that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity potentially. You know that I may not get another. I've been twice. <laughs> I'm so, oh yeah, well, <laughs> you know, as as far as the um, you know, the timetable goes, not not having a real people job or a wife or kids or anything like that, and at 24 to take six months to to figure yourself out. Hopefully, I'll be reaping benefits of it for the rest of my life. Well, that's actually one of my questions I'm going to ask you about in a minute, actually. Do you know what? I'm going to – now, I don't like doing this because I get lost in my uh, – um, I, I kind of get lost in my preparation sometimes. And, and you know, you do have to go back to work once this is all over, don't you? And I'm glad you know that. That yeah, will go to work. Uh, 
I was thinking about that when I was putting my questions together this morning. So let's get to it now. How do you think that the AT is preparing you for work life? And what has been your biggest eye opener so far in that respect? Um, as far as preparing me for work life goes, it's, um, dang, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that it's, it's taught me how to think on my feet and not be phased by, by whatever comes at me. So, you know, regardless of what field I decide to go into, um, it's given me the mindset of, I can tackle any challenge that's in front of me. And, and as it comes, I'll be able to adjust and, and figure out what what works best. I love that from a lot of the younger people who I've spoken to have said something similar. The older people don't think, you know, perhaps they've got more, more or even less confidence, but maybe maybe they've got that, that confidence that life has given them over as time goes by. You're just about to get started in the so-called real world, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and to know that you can do anything, because once you can do this, you feel you can do anything. And, and I know that when I was hiking, particularly in 2014, I said to people, put this on your bloody resume. What a thing for for a, for a potential employer to see somebody who's got that's shown the tenacity and the grit to get this far on the Appalachian Trail. Has it been difficult? Do you think so far? Um, it's certainly been difficult. I think um, you know the mindset's so important. I haven't really let let things phase me. Um, I, I realize that you know would, would I rather be getting up and going to work every day at six a.m. or would I rather be getting up and hiking? You know, appreciating what's what's all around me. And um, you you have to do certain things every day. And you know, it's it's just about having the mindset of I'm going to have to 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 get up and um, Pack your tent. <laughs> yeah, probably not. And you, you're taking a rest now. You're, you're, you're away from the trails. And this morning, you didn't have to get up and pack your tent, did you? Yeah, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a 24-year-old, um, and I know that you finished college, I believe, last year, which was, I guess, COVID. COVID, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of, must be strange to have graduated in that year, actually. Was it always the intention to take a, to take a hike after college and before work? Is that, that's been your plan for some time or not? Uh, not necessarily. To be honest with you, I've only known about the trail for about a year now. And it's funny to think that I'm almost halfway through with it. Um, <laughs> it just it just happened to be something that I, I found, rediscovered my love of the outdoors during the pandemic. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. I went from from taking small hikes to, to taking little solo sabbaticals where I'd spend a couple of days in the woods. And right. that thought just slowly evolved as I learned more and more about the Appalachian Trail and figured it'd be really good to to take six months to kind of figure myself out and sort sort what's going on in my own head. Because your dad's known about the trail, hasn't he? And he and he, he he's taken you camping in the past, I believe. I believe. Was so. When, how did you find out about the trail then? Uh, well, yeah. So my dad, my dad, and my brother are both Eagle Scouts, so they've had far more camping and, and hiking experience than I have. Um, and I actually, so I discovered the trail when I went on my first. Uh, hiking experience my, my brother my sister and I went and did the lemon squeezer up at Harriman State Park in New York right. and cool, um, it? yeah it was it was a really cool experience yeah. and especially uh doing it out with without a giant pack on was much easier yeah, uh, than really? trying to get through it this time <laughs> but um you know it just kind of it, it, it inspired some sort of wonder in me and you know sense of adventure and um I, I believe that I, I I came across Chris Cage's book how to hike hike the Appalachian Trail and, and read that and was like, oh, my goodness, like, this is certainly something that I need to do. And so I know you took when you were in college, you actually did a backpacking course. Had you decided you want did you you wanted to hike the trail by then? Uh, no, at that point, I still had no idea the Appalachian right. Trail was a thing. <laughs> right, um, <even> then. <laughs> yeah. So because I had to I ended up switching my major a couple of times in college, it ended up being you need a certain amount of credits to retain your financial aid. So in a scramble to figure out what the heck I could do to, to, to keep from being kicked out of school because of money, I, uh, I took a backpacking course and absolutely loved it. Um, we did a, a day trip out around, I believe it was the Syracuse area in up, upstate New York. Uh -huh. um, and it was raining the entire time and everyone was miserable but me. I was smiling ear to ear and just felt like a million dollars. And even by the end of the, the, end of the course, the, uh, the teacher came up to me, the instructor, and he said, um, you know, you really have a knack for this. Would you ever want to lead lead trips like this? And at the time, wow. it just it wasn't even on my radar. I would just thought of it as a way for me to stay in school and and get a credit in a in a really fun and different way. A very very lovely way to do, do college, I suspect. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, so, what was it? Was it the what was it about it then? What what, what struck you? If it, if if it 
If it was so clear to your instructor, your teacher, that you could do this and you were you were a potential leader for this, what was it about it that, that really sort of struck a chord for you? I'm not sure. I think it was just the reconnection with the natural world. I had, I had been a Cub Scout um, all throughout elementary school. And uh, when it finally got to, got time to either it's, it was Boy Scouts or to continue to play hockey, I couldn't do both. And I did, I went the hockey route. Right. Um, so I kind of lost that part of me that I enjoyed so much. I lo- always loved climbing trees or being outdoors or being in the mountains. And it was almost like I reawoke the child inside myself when I went and took that course and said, oh my goodness, like it, it really is wonderful to, to be outside and, you know, be reconnected to nature. Wow, that's something. <laughs> so you did a backpacking course, which obviously I, I think is a great thing for somebody to do at college. It taught you the basics of overnight camping. Is that basically what it did for you and how to light a fire and set your yeah, tent up and stuff like that? how to light a fire, how to hang a bear bag, where to try to get falling water rather than something that's stagnant. It really just, just the basics. He was kind of just herding his sheep through this trail and he had, happened to have one one kid you know one crazy kid who was into it way more than the other ones and he uh you know he made it clear to me that he thought that this was something that i'd be good at and like i said didn't really didn't really process it at the time but you know everything kind of works out i wouldn't i wouldn't be here if i wasn't there that's right yeah exactly but you but you did the course if there was one thing and i was again i was thinking, i always think about these these things slightly differently perhaps to other people if there was one thing on that backpacking course that what rather that wasn't on that backpacking course you wish there was what was one piece of advice you wish somebody had given you before you started um I, it sounds it sounds so simple but only take what you need Oh, good Lord. Because uh, <laughs> certainly going into the into the hundred mile wilderness and uh, starting at Katahdin, my base weight uh, before I before I even set out on trail was somewhere around thirty eight pounds. Wow! Yeah. And uh, that was before putting ten days worth of food in my pack wow. and trying to romp, romp through the hundred miles. So <laughs> yeah, take only what you you're absolutely right. So what uh, what things did you take then? Did you take a did you take a laptop or anything like that? No, I did. I did run into someone who had taken the, a laptop as their luxury item, and even to me that seemed kind of bonkers. But um, <laughs> I ended up bringing uh, a tent and a hammock. Used a hammock one time throughout the hundred mile. Excellent. Um, I was carrying <laughs> bear spray and a bear bell and way too many clothes than I needed. I was wearing a ha- carrying a heavy coat that was just completely unnecessary and. Uh, by the time I got to Shaw's in Monson, Maine, just outside of the 100 mile for, for Sobos, uh, Poet does something called a, a shakedown where he'll, he'll yeah. go through your whole pack and just, just ch- kind of give his opinion, his two cents on what he thinks you need and what you don't need. And uh, after that little shakedown, I went, wound up sending home four boxes worth of stuff. Got my, <laughs> got my pack weight down from 38 to somewhere around 25. Well, they, they say you do pack your fears, don't they? Did, but did that what it... Was that what it felt like you t- to you? Because you'd, you'd done 100, by then 110 miles, 112 miles. So you kind of knew where you were by then, you know, in terms of ha- how to, to get through stuff. You very, very quickly find what you're using in your pack and what you're not using, don't you? Oh, yeah, big time. Um, and, 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 and that, so what were, what were you not using? Was it all the extra clothes? Yeah. It was, was it your the, evening clothes and things the like that? The extra clothes, the hammock <laughs> that I had used a single yes, time course, in, the, yeah. in the 100 mile. Um, and just just a whole bunch of stuff like that, little stuff. My med kit was far too big. I was I had you know band aids up the wazoo that I was never really going to be using. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Great. So you so you decided on the AT. So it was COVID, and that's we we hoped that was over last year. Obviously, it's not. But you decided to go. Um, I think it was in November last year you decided that you actually were going to do it. Um, why didn't you go northbound? Well, you know, it, the question is obviously why southbound? Because we don't speak to many southbound hikers. Yeah, um, so it, it's a, a couple parts to the answer. Um, first being, like I mentioned, I've only known the, about the AT for about a year now. Um, <laughs> so deciding that I wanted to do it in November, it only gave me a couple months if I wanted to go northbound. You know, most people usually leave around sometime around March. Um, which is just a short window for me to be figuring out which gear I like and what, you know, what I'm comfortable carrying. Cause, um, a lot of my gear I had to replace because it was all my brother's old boy scout and Eagle scout stuff. So, um, really heavy, really bulky and not, not very easy to use. So, um, it, it let me figure out my gear, um, on top of and, that, and, all- and we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, 
I, I want to talk about your gear for a second. So yeah. you, the stuff you had for your, your overnights, your, your sabbaticals, you used to call them, mm-hmm. th- that was just wasn't working for you or it was just too damn heavy for you? Is that where you basically it was, it? it was working fine. It was just, it was it was old, it was heavy, it was large. I um I had been using my dad's old jet boil and the ignition switch had, had, had gone out. So we went into, into REI one day to try to figure out whether we could either get a new ignition or if they could replace a part of it, whatever. And when the clerk had asked which jet boil that we had, um, I, I think it was the flash, I believe, um, or the zip. And the clerk literally laughed at my dad and I because <laughs> they hadn't made that jet boil in over 10 years. They're like, there's nothing that we can do for you. <laughs> so um, it was just oh, time serious. for new gear, some, some lighter gear of my own. Yeah, so you worked, you worked your gear out. It's hit me too much of it, as you already said. Mm-hmm. But why? But why sober? You didn't want to waste another year to go northbound, because so you know it's quite an intimidating thing. And people will be calling out, "No, it's the best way to go." But I think you know it's intimidating to be starting at Katahdin as your approach trail. That's the thing I can never get out of my head. The climbing of Katahdin was one of the most magical days of my life. But for you, it would have been your approach trail. Yeah, it's it's certainly hard to comprehend that all you know the five five and a quarter miles that you do up don't count until you hit the top and have to start coming back down. That's right. Yeah, that that was sucks. certainly a mental hurdle for me. Yeah. Um, but I think the timing just worked out. It it had to be this year. I didn't want to wait until next year. And and you know you always have these things in the back of your mind that say, okay, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to wait until X Y Z. I'm going to wait until sure. this time. And that time rolls around and there ends up being something else in the way or another excuse or another hurdle to get over. And I just, I didn't want to wait until it was too late. I have this opportunity now. Right. I really wanted to take advantage at the, of it. At your age particularly, it's a really good lesson to learn. At my age, of course, to discover that way too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of opportunities, let me tell you, fast. But, yeah. you know, to, to, to learn it at this age, this is this will give you a mindset for the rest of your life, which I, I, I think is great. Now, and I know that your brother, Jaden, came, I think your dad drove you and your brother up to Katahdin. Kut- yeah, right? so it's, it's about a nine-hour ride from Long Island, where I'm from, up to Baxter that. State Park. Sure. So uh, my brother, my dad, and I all, all went up there. and um, Oh, your dad came up to with you as well? Unfortunately, no. He did. Oh, right. He made it about a mile, um, <laughs> left a hat on a rock just to, as me and my brother came back down to let us know how far he had gotten. But he didn't, he didn't <laughs> even make it to the falls, but he did his, he did his best. All right. Um, I was so able tell to. Us about, tell, us, tell us about the days. What were you feeling? Were you nervous, excited? Was this something that was... Uh, because I think it's a daunting climb anyway. And even looking, if you just look at it on the profile on the maps, it just looks horrendous, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like you're about to scale a wall. And um, <laughs> to be honest with you, I was I was freaking out. I, my, my stomach was upset until the moment I got to Katahdin Stream Campground, set up my tent, and it was it almost became real. It's like, okay, I'm here, I'm ready to go, and there's there's no turning back now. Sure. Um yeah, we, my brother and I were able to, to go up to Katahdin and it was, um, it was a little drizzly in the morning. We stood around, waited for the weather report and it didn't look like it was getting any better. So sure. my brother and I just threw our little day packs on and started up. So tell us about that then, because I know you found it quite tough, didn't you? Uh, not, I mean, originally at the first bit, you think this is easy. I mean, it doesn't look anything like the, the profile as well. And then it just goes vertically yeah, up. Yeah, then it? you get to things like the pull-up bar and you have to hoist yourself <laughs> up a five feet by just, you know, your upper body strength. And you're just like, how did Myron Avery think this was a good idea? He just said straight up. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Um, and you pre- but you had prepared that, hadn't you? You 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 were physically relatively fit. You'd done a lot of uh, uh, training in in Harriman, Harriman State Park, hadn't you? Yeah. So there's a I want to say there's somewhere between three and four hundred miles in Harriman State Park. So I kind of made it my little goal um, from between December when or November when I decided to do the trail, and when I left in June uh, to just try to paint that park and do as many of the trails as I possibly could. Wow, you must have been in some pretty bad weather as well, then, wouldn't you? Yeah, so it was, wasn't winter. great. Um, <laughs> there were a couple of times my feet were wet and cold and frozen and there was nothing I could do but but try to get back to the car and, and try to, you know, rethink my strategy and go back Suck at it. Suck it up, buttercup. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you climb Katahdin and, and I can I feel it now, you know, that moment you get above tree line for the first time and you see this bloody vertical wall in front of you. Mm-hmm. How were you coping with that physically and emotionally? 
physically I was doing okay. Obviously, you know, you get tired the further and further up you go and you get above that tree line, you just get hit with the gust of wind and you're like, oh my gosh, you, it almost <laughs> becomes real. You're like, what I'm doing is dangerous. Oh yeah, This, is, really? this isn't just a walk in the park anymore. <laughs> no. Um, and, and, these to, miles and these miles don't count. I would always remind myself of that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I totally wanted the experience of climbing Katad and I didn't want to go up the A-Ball Trail. I'm like, this is... This is what everybody dreams of, and I want this experience. And um, to be completely honest with you, had I not had my little brother standing there next to me, I don't know if I would have made it up. There were there were several times that I I stood there and looking up at this this daunting challenge in front of me and thinking like I don't know if I can keep going up. And then I would look next to me and my brother wide eyed staring right back at me like I just dragged him nine hours out here to drop <laughs> me off at this mountain. What am I going to do? Turn around at the first one. Um, so having him there really, really helped me get up, and uh, I, re I'm, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. I, oh, to do the whole thing with your brother must be pretty darn cool, yeah. It was, it was really nice, yeah. And um, by the time we had gotten down to the bottom, my dad was already waiting at camp, flipping burgers, and had a case of beer ready for us. So of course, that was, he was. That quite was right too. Yeah, quite right too. So, did you get that feeling? You got to the top, you touched the sign. You probably thought, well, this is what other people feel. This must be, you know, the ones who've done this at the end of their journey. Was it an exciting moment for you to? You, I presume you've got your your Katahdin picture, haven't you? Yeah, I do. I got a I got a great picture of my brother and I on top of the sign, and also me giving it a kiss as I'm about to start my start my through hike after I'd gotten up there. <laughs> right. So you start down, and that is tough, by the way, isn't it? Going down, I, I think, in many ways, is tougher than going up. It took me longer to go down than it did to go up. Mm -hmm. it took me, I think. Four hours to go up and five hours to come down, something something like that. Yes. So you went down, your dad was flipping burgers, but then you're on your own because they're going back to Long Island. Did you team up with people straight away? Because the 100-mile the wilderness, and you hit it straight away, don't you? Well, it's about 10-mile walk to Abel Bridge, and then you hit the 100-mile wilderness after that. It's quite a daunting place, I would imagine, if you're on your own. How did you find it? Um, I found it, uh, first of all, absolutely gorgeous. Um, second of all, it was certainly challenging. Uh, prior to coming out on the AT, I think the longest I had spent in the woods to that point was maybe four nights. All right. Um, so night five was a big deal. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was just, it was, it was so important to me to not treat it like a job, not feel like I have to wake up and I have to walk to treat it like a vacation, like I get to be here, I don't have to be here. Um, and I think that mindset certainly helped me get through the 100 mile. I've told people before on the show that I, I I've did it two different ways, and I'm glad the second way I did it, I stayed in the 100 mile wilderness for all six days, and I really enjoyed that part of it as well. Did you work out the resupply? Do you get the resupply from which end do you get it from Millinocket, or do you get it from um, from um, uh, from Monson, or did you take six or seven days worth of food? So unfortunately. Uh you know, I'd mentioned I've only known about the trail for about a year now. I only knew about a resupply the morning I was about to leave for Katahdin. So, so I could, I certainly could have done more research to make my life a little easier, but I tried to carry that food ten, thing. Yeah, yeah that food I tried thing, to yeah. carry 10 days of food through the 100, through the 100 mile, which didn't work out, um, unfortunately. So I, I, had, I had met a man in the 100 mile and they met a uh, mountain doctor, wonderful person. He actually had uh, fibromyalgia which is a, a rare neurological disorder where he, he lost the use of his legs and he had to reteach himself how to walk and he's walking through the 100 mile with no pulse. Oh my gosh. Um, he ends up twisting an ankle at Namakanta Lake. And I remember that lake, I loved it. Beautiful, absolutely Great place you can park, you can camp just inside, the, just off the beach, can't you? Oh, uh -huh. it's just an awesome place. But he had, he had twisted his ankle and uh, decided that he wanted to, to get out at Joe Mary Road and run right. into Millinocket to, to rest up and see if it was it was serious. And uh, he he told me, he's like, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Do you want to do you want to come to Millinocket with me? And I was like, I need a zero day. I, <laughs> I need to figure out, refigure my food. I tried to go in with living off trail mix and protein powder. And that was a Excellent. mistake. How's that working out for you? <laughs> nah, not well. You know, every every hike that I'd gone on before this, I usually bring like a nice size block of cheese or pepperoni and stuff like that. But having Katahdin first, I didn't want that stuff sitting in my bear can for, yeah. for an extended period of time and possibly going bad. So I just, I had to come out. I rethought my food strategy, um, went back in and, and cruised ever since then. Well, you and I spoke last night, and I don't normally then record the next day, Just, but you're on a little break with your mother and father right now in Boynton Springs. And I was taking notes as we spoke, as I always do. 
And one thing that really stood out to me, and it, it was an expression you used, I actually never heard it, these two words used in conjunction with one another. You said that this trip is one big exercise of cognitive flexibility. I, I know what you mean by that because we did talk about it. So, so tell people what you actually mean by that. Well, uh, what I mean by cognitive flexibility is you have to be able to adjust on the fly. You know, you can do as much planning as you want, but if you're if you're unwilling or unable to adjust and make and make changes to your plan, you're not going to have a good time. You, you're not going to be out here a long time. And I, I've been saying this a lot. Yeah, I could have gotten my gear wrong, my logistics wrong, my food, my gear, whatever. But I came out with the right mindset, um, which is the reason I've made it as far as I have. Do you feel confident you'll get to the end now? I certainly do. I think. Um, I mean, yeah. all other things notwithstanding, broken ankles and things like that, you can't do anything about that, can yeah. you? Yeah, if everything in terms goes of, well. Yeah, in, in, exactly. Yeah, I, I should, sorry, I should, I should always, always preface it with yeah. that if your fingers cross the whole nine yards, you know. But you, you feel confident that there's something you, you, this is something you do, you can now do. You're into that, that thing of that rhythm of the hike that people talk about a lot. How's it, how does it feel with you? Is this something that you're finding out now? you're better at than you imagined you would be? I think so. Um, and I think it's mainly the mental part of it. You know, physically I knew I would be okay. Yeah. Um, but anxiety and depression is something that I've to totally struggled with over the past few years. So the thought of being out here and running into a situation that I potentially couldn't handle was scary. Um, running into... Uh, an obstacle I felt I couldn't overcome was scary. So now that I've, I've at, I'm at this point, I've been using my mindset of, of cognitive flexibility and being unbothered by things that I can't control. I'm far, far more confident that I'll be able to, to be in this for the long haul. That's great. What a lovely feeling to have. You know, it's just... And the funny thing is, because you've done Katahdin, the, the biggest mountain, you've done the 100 Mile Wilderness, you've also done Maine and yeah. New Hampshire. You know, they are the toughest things to do right at the very beginning. First off, which did you prefer, Maine or New Hampshire, by the way? I think Maine, but it's certainly weather dependent. I had far better weather oh, in, in Maine than go. going through New Hampshire. I agree, that makes a lot of difference. And so once they were over, because everyone says that was it. You, once you've got to to New Hampshire, if you go northbound, you've done eighty percent of the miles and done twenty percent of the effort. Once they were over, how does the mindset of a sobower, or in this case you, change? Because all this the tough stuff is in your rearview mirror. Do you feel you've relaxed a bit because of it? Because of the tough stuff. Um. I've certainly tried to relax a bit, but every time you walk past a Nobo, they tell you whatever's coming is a hundred times worse than whatever you just went through. Um, I've, I've learned at this point that if a Nobo tells you something's a 10, it's usually about a five. Um, and that, that, that actually kind of helps because you're, you're never really letting your guard down. You're always like, okay, I'm ready to deal with the next challenge and you get it. And it's, it's not as bad as you would have thought. Like um, Rocksylvania has been a lot, a lot easier than I really thought it was going to be. Really? Yeah. Really? It's not, it's, it, it, but it's, it's, it's easier in a different way, though, isn't it? I mean, the mountains in New Hampshire and Maine are so darn tough, but the rocks are still pretty dark, pretty tough. It's, there's no place to put your feet, is there, in, in rocks of Maine? It, has, it hasn't been easy, but it certainly hasn't, hasn't been as bad as I had it, had it pegged out to be in my head. And are you aware that, you know, because you've done all the, a lot of the so-called tough stuff, then is there a danger of getting too confident with it? Because that was always when I used to fall over. When I thought I'd done something really well and I walked on the flat, I'd go. Um, I don't think it's it's so much, you know, being too overconfident and, and powering through states. I think the issue that I face is if it's a town day, I'll catch myself running and I'm like, wait a minute, there's no reason for you to hurt yourself <laughs> five miles before you get a break, slow down a little bit. Yeah. And you shared with me, uh, last night, some of those issues that you'd had with social anxiety in the past, and many people find answers to that when they're on the, on a big big hike. And I and I know for you that the transformation you were saying last night has been quite dramatic, hasn't it? Did you notice that straight away, or did you expect that to happen because of you were already already enjoying being in the woods in the past? Um, I don't think I expected it to be this almost night and day. Really? Um, I I knew that the being outdoors was good for me. I knew that. Being alone, you know, kind kind of working out what was going on in my own head, you know, on my own was good for me. Um, but I didn't, um, I couldn't imagine when I'd gotten on the trail that my anxiety and depression would almost completely dissipate. 
to the point where I'm, I'm going to probably slowly be, in, be weaning myself off uh, my antidepressants relatively soon because the, the, uh, the effects of being in nature have just been that profound. And uh, wow. as, as for the well, well, soul, hang on, talk to that, talk to that a bit. So you 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 take anti anti antidepressants, yeah. I'd, I had yeah. tried um, Zoloft, went all the way up, didn't do anything for me. I had tried Prozac, same situation, went as high as they were legally allowed to give me, didn't do anything. Um, over the pandemic, I, I got on uh, Wellbutrin, which has worked pretty well. Um, and since getting on the trail, because anxiety and depression basically hasn't existed in my head. I've slowly started to, to wean off the medication. You've not mentioned many other people. Most people talk about the people that meet on the trail. Is that because, and, I, and I'm flying with this one, so I'm not sure which way this is going to go, That's actually. Um, is that because you've tended to be by yourself and you've worked out some of those issues yourself or have you enjoyed the company of people so much that that's helped your um, social anxiety? Um, it's, it's been kind of a nice combination. I think the part of the beauty of going southbound is you get the time by yourself and you get to spend time with different people. You know, I'll, I'll walk for myself for two or three days and then I'll be with a trail family for a day or two. And then I'll right. get another couple of days of solidarity and then I'll be with a different, whether it's trail family or another person or whatever it is. And, um, it's almost retaught my brain from what it was conditioned to think is people are going to hurt me or people are not going to care about what I have to say, or I'm not important, you know, to so-and-so to, I can open up about what I really feel that, you know, is important to me because this person genuinely cares about what I have to say. And that's been my experience from Maine to Pennsylvania now is whoever I run into, they're so welcoming. They're so understanding. They're so appreciative of just your honesty and, and you get it back from them the same way that you dish it out. There's that feeling of equality, isn't there? It's, I bet, you, really I bet nice. you met old gits like me, and you met you met young youngsters younger than you, and yet you you still find that there's a a level of commonality that you just don't get anywhere else, is there? It's been incredible. Yeah, I have um, a trail grandpa no box out there somewhere is a couple of days ahead of me, and I have <laughs> as deep conversations with him as some of the the eighteen year old kids that I've met on the trail also. And there's there's almost it's almost age is, age isn't a thing on the trail because you're you know you're all out here in some sort of transition period, whether it's after high school, after college, after the military, after retirement, and everyone's out here looking for something, whether it's within themselves or um, on the trail in the world. A lot of people I've experienced come out here and almost restore their faith in humanity or come out here and like myself, reconnect with who they really are. And I've felt more myself than I have in, in years since I've been wow. on the trail and it's been really incredible. You, you've got, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly no doctor, but my guess is once you're in, you seem to be enjoying this and so positive about this, that you've got to not guard or even be worried about, but you've got to think when you finish, what am I going to replace it with? Because I know that's one of the problems for a lot of people, but you're going to replace it with work, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> That'll get you going. <laughs> I think um, what's what's in the back of my head and what I'm going to be thinking, out, uh, thinking about a lot in the next uh, couple of months is... How am I going to integrate what I'm learning on the trail back into into the quote unquote real world? How mm -hmm. um how am I going to feel the benefits from this wonderful experience that I'm giving myself for the rest of my life? Um, and I I haven't necessarily nailed down an answer for that yet. Don't worry, you uh, won't you won't even when you get into Georgia, you think, oh my god, we're nearly it's nearly finished. I haven't worked it out yeah. yet. But it, you don't you know what? You don't have to work out life at this age. You don't even have to work out life at my age. You know, it is there. You enjoy, you take it for what it is, and you enjoy it. If you or you don't enjoy, it, it's up to you. Um, so ha has your thought about what you might want to do? I don't even know what your what your major is in, but have you got? You, what's your thought about what you might want to do when you finish this? I and think, has that changed? Um. My, my major was sport management, and nice. after being in college for five years, I've just, I think I've decided that that's not really what I want to do, unfortunately. <laughs> Your dad would be um, delighted by that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, something that I've experienced out here is the, the therapeutic benefits of being outdoors, and um, I'd really like to share that with others. I think um, at some point in my future, leading therapeutic recreation retreats and having people experience what I've experienced um, would be something that I'd be really interested in. As far as maybe getting, you know, going back to school, getting some sort of psychology degree or, or something like that, and bringing people together, speaking about our issues, planning a trip, taking them out to experience the, the benefits that I have, 
um, and te giving them the tools to be able to do it on their own. Yes, you know, I think that's such a great goal to have as well, really is. And it combines a number of different things that you've done and even some, sort of combines some of your major. If you're interested in sports, this is the outdoor it's sports, you know. Mm -hmm. So you had that tough time on Katahdin. Have you had any other tough days that you thought, oh, geez, I'm not sure I can do this? Um, not really. I mean... <laughs> The, so it's the, your brother's fault then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's my brother's fault that I'm still out here. Had he not been on Katahdin, I don't know if I would have made it this far. Um, I've certainly had had tough days, normally weather related. Uh, there have been a couple of times where I'm trying to set up my tent in the rain, and by the time you get the rain fly on, there's already a puddle about an inch deep in where you're supposed to be sleeping. Nice. That doesn't that doesn't make life easy. Um, but other than that, I'm just I'm so set on being unbothered by things that I can't control. Um, you know, whether it's, it's raining out, there's nothing I can do about it. Why would I let it bother me? It's, yeah. you know, I'm stepping on rocks all through Pennsylvania. What am I going to do? Re re lean over and pick up every rock and throw it off the trail. <laughs> like there's nothing I can do about it. So why am I going to let it affect my mood and my energy and, uh, my positive outlook? That's so cool. So, so when do you expect to finish? Um, I'd love to finish by around the first week of November. Uh, yeah. In order to do that, I got to do something like 22 miles a day, six days a week until until that. But uh, don't rush, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, it will be over too soon, man. And and I think I'm, I'm not sure you regret it, but you you'll be so you'll be so accomplished when you get there. You'll be you're so you've so glad you've achieved your goal. But don't wish it. Don't wish it over. You know, enjoy it. Get a bit of cold weather in Georgia. Don't worry about all that. You'll be fine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm certain. I'm certainly not wishing it over, and I'm. It's not lost on me how how grateful I have to be to be out here and be doing what I'm doing every day. That's cool. Well, look, I really appreciate you coming on the show, and, and what I'd like if you could just come back and just confirm you finished uh, towards you know when you do finish, just come on, just talk about it for about ten minutes, and we'll just just sum up how the second half went and see if you're. Uh, if your cognitive flexibility was able to be maintained all the way through, okay? Absolutely. I'd love to, Mighty Blue. Thank you so much. Okay, man. Well, take it easy, all right? All right. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Wasn't he a thoughtful, insightful, in fact, young man? His cognitive flexibility was a new expression to me, but it perfectly summed up the mindset you need to do this. It's almost as if he's learned it via osmosis. And that exposure to the trail that either makes you or breaks you. In Christian's case, he seems so attuned to it that, injuries aside, I can't see any way in which he doesn't make it to Georgia. It was also good to be chatting with a Soboer, and I've been aware for some time that we needed a few of those to balance the show a bit. Thanks this week goes to our wonderful donors who really keep these shows on the air. Monthly donors Todd Withrow and Suzanne Johnson stuck with us, and Andy Hood revealed himself as obsessed footwear telling me that even though he doesn't work there anymore, his PayPal account seems to bear that name. Nice to meet you, Andy. And Wanda Guion asked about buying my books directly from me and getting me to sign them. She went online, donated more than I asked for, and told me to put the balance in my tip jar. Thanks, Wanda. The books are on the way. Now, from an airport in Pensacola, here's Katie on her way back to the trail. Well... Um, I'm on with Katie with some interesting background noises. That does not sound like New Hampshire or Maine. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> I am sitting in an airport in Florida, uh, heading back to Maine after a long weekend with family at the beach. Now, I, that is a way to do a hike. I tell you, going <laughs> to the beach to do a hike is probably a, as about as good a, good a thing as you can do. Did it help you? <laughs> Wait, I mean, how long have you been there? I, you, how long have you been there? Uh, I Four days. Uh, I would say three full days. I, I came for a family reunion and then uh, stayed with my daughters and their families. And it certainly did fill up my bucket and uh, recharge me. But do you think you may have lost a bit of that rhythm we talked about? I don't know whether you ever, uh, when, when I think yeah. when we when, when I finished talking with you last week, I said how I thought mm -hmm. you'd really got your rhythm back, and now of course, yeah, you, you, you left. Did you feel you've lost some of that or not? You know, I, I guess I, I see it a different way. I, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like once I get on trail, I do that. You know, I, I do my thing when I'm there. I'm totally focused on that when I'm hiking. And, you know, but when I'm with my family, it, re it, it 
it fills me emotionally. Um, sure. You know, they're my support. And yeah. So it really, you know, for me, uh, the last time I did this, I came back even stronger. So I cool. felt, you know, really good. So, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm about to get into some pretty difficult stuff. My, my last week of hiking over the Bigelows was pretty challenging. And I yes. know that, you know, the terrain is, you know, progressively more difficult. So I'm prepared to accept those lower mile days. What was the logistics then of getting off the trail? What did you have to do? I mean, where did you stop? That is always, for me, one of the challenges. Um, sure. So I stopped in Stratton, and I'm returning to Stratton. I stayed at a little hostel there called Main Road House. Uh-huh. Uh, lovely, lovely new hostel. Nice. And uh, – I was able to get a shuttle from one of their shuttle drivers to um, Portland, Maine. And then I flew out of Portland, Maine uh, to Florida. And then now I'm flying back today to Portland, Maine, where the shuttle driver will pick me up and take me back to Stratton. And and then I'll be back on trail. (laughs) How far is it from from Portland then? Like a two-hour drive. It's, it's It's a lot of work to get on and off trail. So, yes. but you know, when you have, when you have this family that, that is supporting you all the way along, you know, and, mm. and, you know, sometimes you do that and, and, and I'm grateful for that. I'm, you know, I, I think, and I don't know if it's my age or what, but I, you know, I, I find that it really helps me to, to connect and, and see those people I love so dearly. And so, you, so the people you you were hiking with some people for a while, weren't you? Have you lost those there or not? Well, so probably during the hundred mile wilderness, um, you know, my pace was a little faster than some of you know than the people I was hiking with. So uh-huh. I was a bit ahead of them. But I think now they're probably you know maybe two days three days ahead of me. So I may try to reconnect with uh, one hiker. Uh, she's, she has a lot of experience hiking. You know, she's about my age, but she has a, a ton of experience in the big mountains. And so um, I think my pace over the next few days may close our, our gap. And I, I kind of would like to hike with her through the whites. I think it'd uh-huh. be nice for us to have that, you know, support. But of course now, Katie, you've got a huge amount of experience as well. You've done over a thousand, over a thousand miles. You know, it's funny. I've spoke to somebody recently on the show, and she said that you know someone asked her about through hiking. She said, "I don't know anything about through hiking." They said, "Of course you do. You just done it for two for two (laughs) thousand miles." So you know, it's amazing how it's amazing how this this experience that we have actually becomes part of our almost our hiking resume, I guess, doesn't it? So you've got that that, that experience yourself. Are you looking forward to it? Yes, I am. I really am. And, and I, I have talked to some people who, you know, you get, you get different perspectives on the white and, and Southern Maine. Some people are like horrified. (laughs) Some people are like, you know what? It's a little intimidating, but just enjoy it have fun. And, and I do have, you know, I have fun on the challenging mountains. It's just, you have to just slow down. There's just, I mean, there's no way at, you know, that I feel safe to try to blow through these mountains. No, you really can't. You know, you really can't. No, I, we, we, we took, uh, I think we, our best day, no, we averaged, uh, when I went in 2014, 11 miles a day. And we've Mm -hmm. been doing, 15s to 18s before that but you know what yeah. there's something about them which is so magnificent and that you're I think you're yeah. gonna I think you're gonna love and also you, you you're going from a different direction to the way I went obviously so I wonder what it's like mm-hmm. to go southbound but I I still yeah. think you know, the magnificence of the whites is still going to win you over anyway absolutely I'm looking forward to it you know I'm I am now paying attention to weather depth you know just very closely as I get closer and you know so just watching the weather making sure I'm not up on the you know above tree line right yes Yes. during really bad conditions that's an amazing experience by the way good being above tree line is just awesome now (laughs) now, you you haven't reached I don't think you've reached Mahusit Notch yet have you no 
Nope. So that's coming up probably within within the week, within a week or so. So once again, enjoy it. It is just it's, it's like will. it's like a big boulder field. It's a, it's a jigsaw puzzle. There are loads <laughs> of different ways to go across. You do not have to follow the white blazes because basically Mm-mm. you're gonna walk you're gonna walk through boulders the size of buses and just try to clamber <laughs> over them, under them, through them. Oh, it's just awesome. Yeah. You're, you're gonna you're gonna have a great time. Yeah. Okay, well, well, I'm I, looking forward to it. Well, I know you've got a plane to catch, so uh, I, I knew this was going to be a short check-in, but I uh, appreciate you okay. keeping, uh, keeping up with this, and uh, good luck with next great, week, and we'll, we'll chat again when you would have done a full, another four weeks of hiking. It sounds great. Talk to you okay. soon, Steve. Cheers then. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. You know what? She is 100% right. You do what you need to do to make this a successful hike, and Katie wanted a family. She's now refreshed, nourished by her family, and heading back to Maine, Mohusik Notch, the White Mountains, and everything else. Why wouldn't you take the chance for a break before those adventures? Now, let's hear from our sponsor, Ryan McCormick, and his contribution to the important subject of Leave No Trace. Here's Ryan. So, I'd like to introduce you to Ryan McCormick, who is the inventor of the three-point moldy tool. So, hey, Ryan, good to have you on the show, and thank you so much for sponsoring us as well. Oh, you're welcome, Steve. Good morning. You and I have been wondering what we're going to do about this. And, and this is an interesting topic, you know, leave no trace is something that is so important. And when you first approached me to do it, I was kind of sceptical about what you were even trying to sell, because... Let's face it, everyone's got a trowel, and even though they're pretty tricky to actually dig a hole to the correct depth, then they kind of do the job sometimes. But you take issue with that point of view. Um, so tell us what it was that made you see a place in the pooping market that needed to be filled. Um, okay, Steve, uh, crazy story. I, I actually came up with this idea sitting on the toilet. Um, Excellent. The best place <laughs> for all ideas. Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> no, j- just just leaning to one side, putting putting the weight under your hip. You know when people clean up after a business meeting. I've been there. It's okay. Under, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we all have. <laughs> yeah, um, just something to alleviate the weight off your legs and your thighs to uh, help you out, out, out in the woods. And, and, wow. and that's where the idea came up from. And then... It, it kind of progressed from there. I, I After that, I was like, okay, well, I have a stand, and now it's going to be a trowel, you know, a two-handed trowel to help you dig better. And then, well, what could I do with the other yes, two Yes, that's hands? an important point, by the way. That's an important point. I, when I, when I, because I, I was intending to use this on, on the John Muir trowel, and I, as people know, I, it didn't work out for me. But I've used it since to do it, and it makes it so much easier to dig it with two hands. I mean, it really right. does. It's, it's remarkably different, actually. Yeah, thanks. Um, exactly, and uh, I wanted something that I could, you know, s- strike the ground with, like a like a like a pickaxe, and yeah. then you know, something that could also be, you know, you could pop out your tent pegs, and and then have a hammer on the other end where you can pound in your tent pegs once you get to camp. So it, it kind of progressed from something to help you lean in the in the woods to to a pick to a hammer, and yeah, uh, yeah that's 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 how it all it kind of, changed. It works well. I, and, and I must confess now, and I know I shouldn't, because I've said you know we should all practice leave no trace principles, and I, and I had tried to, and we did, do generally try to, but I can guarantee you, I'm not the only person who, from time to time, when I was hiking last year, and certainly earlier in the year when the ground's pretty damn hard, I, I, I my trail just wasn't up to it, so I would dig a hole with my foot. I know I shouldn't, and I know I couldn't have gone to the six or seven inches uh, deep that you meant to go to, and. I get there are other, I know there are others out there who did not have a trowel at all to save weight for some strange reason and literally dug with their foot every time. So leave no trace is important to you as a concept, isn't it? It is. Um, I, I, I hate when you go to the, the trail and you, you step off and you know you might come across the the, the toilet paper uh, minefield and yes, um, yeah, you, you have to do something with it either. You know, take it away in a wag bag and in certain parks or or bury it. That's, yeah, yeah, you have to get rid of it somehow. I do think it's the the least observed of the leave no trace principles, really. To be honest with you, and uh-huh. what more of a trace could there be? You know, um, and, and as I say, it, it does serve a bunch of functions. Um, how did you 
what were you thinking about when you were refining it? You, could you, were you kept, did you keep trying to find a shape that would have all these functions or did the shape suddenly become possible to get these functions on? Was that, was that the plan? Was, did one thing lead to another or, or did really your whole idea about getting the rest suddenly come to the dig in the hole and the, the pick and the, and the hammer? Is that, is that how it all developed? It did um, uh, quite a few prototypes, uh, you know, reducing weight, uh, adding sure. strength, adding strength, and and uh, with cutting out weight, they're even I even hand sand these, so they're they're actually pretty, you know, there's there's no rough edges in your hand. Um, That's not you're just, right. Yeah, 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 just to have that strength of two hands and something to strike the ground with. And, 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 and who did you develop this with? I mean, who who built it for you? Uh, there's a company here in Calgary, uh, Allied Metal. They uh, they oh. specialize in seismic, uh, oil companies, uh, aircraft. Um, they, uh, <laughs> so they do the aircraft and pooping tools. Excellent. What a what a <laughs> di- what a diverse company that is. Yeah, yeah they diversify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they so they designed it, and I know that the they, and I'm going to have a picture on the in the show notes of you with the tool, just so you can show people. It's um, it's got these cutouts, and that was designed. I mean, that that must be quite a fine balance because to keep the strength, but at the same time have more little cutouts, so you reduce the weight. I presume is it was the uh, that was a reason. I presume wasn't it? Correct, correct. All, all the cutouts are all uh, done by laser. Uh, it's, it's all cut out by laser, then and then have folded. They 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 fold it in some sort of press machine, um, wow. and then welded. And then there's this quite a process into uh, getting it the way it is. So you've had, you've had the, these various prototypes. You've got you've now got this one out up and running. And mm-hmm. what it, what else are you going to be doing? You're going to be getting getting more gear for Cedar Trail gear or not? There is. A, I'm, I'm working with another developer on actually doing a, a titanium version, but one thing we're finding with titanium, it isn't quite as, as rigid as uh, aluminum. It, it's uh, quite a bit softer. And, <laughs> you, do, and, you don't want to be, you don't want to be sitting on it and that, and that fold over. That's not going to work at all well. No, no, no. <laughs> you, you don't want no surprises. <laughs> Um, oh, <laughs> so, so if people want to see it, they got, I'm, I say I'm going to show a picture of you holding it. Uh, but uh, if people want to see it, where, where should they go to check it out? Oh, they can go to my website is uh, cedartrailgear.com. You know, this is like a advanced technology. It's, it's certainly a technology that is more than just a basic trail, obviously, um, and that costs money, obviously. So, okay. how much does it, how much does it cost in US dollars? So I know you're you're Canadian. You you think in Canadian dollars. Right, it's, it's it's around fifty five dollars US, but it's uh, you know the the price of aluminum nowadays is, is getting yeah. more expensive by the day, and yeah. and it's you know it's a premium product that takes quite a quite a few steps to make. It's uh, sure. It's, sure. It's, it's a bit of work to get it all done. So yeah, well you know I'm. I never thought I'd be advertising a seat for for the woods <laughs> with, with, with um, um, all these different functions, but I, I do appreciate you, firstly, you sponsoring us, and I appreciate you coming up with something which means so much. Leave No Trace means so much, and so many people do ignore it. So I thank you for coming up with that, and uh, thanks for coming on the show to tell us about it. Great. Thank you, Steve. Good talking to you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. He invented it sitting on the loo. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> Isn't that where all men have their best thoughts? Actually, when we finished, Ryan sent me a note that mentioned a few other things he wished he'd mentioned in our chat. He wanted to point out that the tool is made locally, not in China. He really didn't want something made cheaply, which I guess is reflected in the price. But when you think about it, for a six-month hike, 50-odd bucks is a small sum to pay for applying Leave No Trace principles. Way better than you could with a trowel or, a big no-no, using your boot. He also mentioned that a friend of his uses it as a self-defence tool, which makes a lot of sense to me. And he was obviously on a roll because he added that it's very helpful in cleaning a fire pit and even in cracking open a bottle of craft beer. So I may even start a contest to work out how many uses you can put it to. Thanks, Ryan. Don't forget, if you want to start a podcast on the Hiking Radio Network, you can contact me at steve at hikingradionetwork.com and I can fill you in on the details, the cost and what you're going to get for your money. I'm currently talking with three interested parties, but if you have a show idea, whether it's a one-off hike or a regular weekly or monthly hiking show, we can work out what that looks like and what it will cost you. Finally today, in passing through, Wyndham Porter describes a very cold morning in a very cold house. 
I'll see you next week. Chapter 5. A Cold Snap It was colder than normal this morning. A bit of north wind was pounding the house. The large plastic sheet that we had nailed to the wall, stirred by the drafts that were getting through, sounded as if it were breathing. The little heater had shut down, beaten by the cold, but the red thermometer display on it was still flashing. It registered the indoor temperature at only 32 degrees Fahrenheit. I rolled over and checked on the girls from my vantage point on the couch. Margie was lying on her side with the baby, Ali, wrapped tightly in her arms, and they both appeared comfortable under the large down comforter. Showing her golden retriever loyalty, Skye was curled up on the other side of Ali, helping Mum keep the baby warm. Skye heard my movement and turned her head to me, as if to confirm that the baby was fine. But then, raising her head higher, she pointed her nose in the direction of four-year-old Sierra, as if to say, but you better check on that one. I looked toward where little Sierra was sleeping and immediately noticed her feet lying where her head should be. Sierra had somehow managed to flip herself inside the bag and her head was now jammed into the claustrophobic foot box. I was still taken in Sierra's predicament when she started to wriggle inside that bag. The contortions got faster and were followed by muffled screams. Skye jumped up, whimpering at Sierra's kicking feet. Sierra's screams grew louder, stirring Margie out of her sleep. I stepped over the mass of people, grabbed Sierra's feet and tried to snatch her out of the bag, but in a panic she was twisting and flailing, keeping herself stuck. The dog saved the day. Skye took the foot of the sleeping bag in her teeth and started pulling, giving me the leverage to yank Sierra from the bag. Sierra popped into the cold room and went sprawling on the mattress. She immediately curled into a fetal position and crying. I reached down and scooped her up, wrapped her into the blanket and held her in my arms, trying to calm her down. Marty was up on one elbow now, groggily trying to see what was going on. I laid Sierra carefully down on the mattress next to Margie, and Sierra began to calm down. Alison slept through the entire event. Skye made a last patrol to make sure everything was all right. She circled the room and returned to her place beside Alison. Mother, daughters and dog were soon sleeping soundly again. I couldn't drift off again, though. After I delivered Sierra from the sleeping bag, I discovered that I was up for good. I glanced at my Casio wristwatch, 5.58am, elevation 3,102 feet, temperature 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which meant that I was still on the mountain, that it was going to be a cold day. I'd had word from the rangers watching the registry at Amicalola that more than 100 hikers had launched off Springer Mountain in the past few days, and yesterday's ridge runners estimated that at least 60 of them were within 8 miles of the store. They would all push hard to reach mountain crossings today. I step into the breezeway with Skye and quietly lock the door. A cool breeze slips through the corridor and I zip my jacket up. I pull on some Gore-Tex mittens. Outside the breezeway, a carpet of fine snow covers the ground. I'm scooping up a fistful of the white stuff off the old stone wall, instinctively looking across the road to the trail, when I notice a small beam of light from a headlamp leading a tall, thin hiker walking off the trail on the south side of the road. It's a familiar stride, belonging to a white-bearded man who holds a single hiking staff that equals his height. His old tilly hat is flapping in the wind. I walk closer and yell out, Bumberfoot, is that you? Sky runs toward the shadow, tail wagging. Billy looks up as he reaches the parking lot, acknowledges my call and kneels down to greet Sky. As he comes closer, I holler, Welcome back, old man. I heard you were out there somewhere. Yep, he says, grinning, somewhere. I'll tell you, getting down Blood Mountain is a bitch in the snow. The toughest challenges in these conditions would have been close to the top, where the trail passes over stretches of bare, slick rock. Also, many of the trail's white blazes are painted on the rock over that stretch. So if the snow sticks up there, then a first-time hiker could easily lose not just his footing, but also the trail itself. Billy Bumblefoot is no first-timer, though. He could walk this mountain blindfolded. Got some coffee for an old friend, he asks. I tell him that I've been planning on making some just as soon as I shovel some salt over the stairs. I ask him to grab some wood from the pile and tell him that I'll meet him at the front door of the shop. Then I salt the stairs and the walkways and head for the door, eager to get out of the bitter cold air. I hold the door for Billy and he goes into the shop with an armload of firewood and starts to build a fire in the stove. I come in behind him and head for the back to turn on the lights and grind and prepare the coffee, a Brazilian roast. I check on Billy. Need anything? Might want to grab more of that wood. This ain't going to last long. 
Got it. Coffee's brewing in the back. Help yourself. I grab a load of wood and start back to the store. Hurried by the cold, I'm not paying enough attention and I step on a patch of ice outside the breezeway. The wood flies out of my hands and over my head and I land flat on my back in snow-filled flower beds. Sky runs up to investigate the situation and starts looking me over like a mother checking for bruises. She's sympathetic, but stern. Her eyes seem to say, You idiot. Slowly, carefully, I stand up and gather the wood and return to the store, trying to forget the episode. I find Billy in front of the counter, sipping on a cup of coffee from the same Superman mug that he's carried for years. He looks up and strokes his long beard and says, Took a spill, did you? I'm stunned. How in hell does he know? You some kind of wizard, old man. No, Billy says, chuckling. It's just that you either took a fall or you knocked the shit out of your head on purpose. That's a pretty good-sized gash on your forehead, son. I reach up and feel warm blood making a slow drip along my forehead. Damn that bear. I thought he was carrying a knife. That son of a bitch. Billy starts to laugh, pulls a paper towel from the dispenser and hands it to me. Ask him where he's been, since I haven't seen him in almost a year. On the trail, mostly, he says. Thought I'd found a girlfriend, but she ran off with a model from New York. No big deal. I'm too busy to be tied down anyway. How about you? Everything all right at the crossings? Everything abnormal as usual. What does the traffic look behind you? With Billy here, I could collect the best information available. Nobody passes him on the trail. He laughs after another sip of coffee and says, You got some good ones heading your way. I say you should have at least two rescues before noon. Then again, there's one I'm thinking who might not even let you rescue him. He's carrying at least 65 pounds and ain't got a lick of food with him. I'd say he's more or less set on getting himself killed. Did you give him some food? Tried, but he said he was going to live only on so much as the land and the good Lord would provide, like the other creatures of the forest. Well, if I were a bear, I'd tell him he's got a deal. He'll be all right. He had one of them Tom Brown survival books. If he gets real hungry, maybe he could eat it. Billy nurses his coffee, raising his eyebrows as he does so, remembering something. Almost forgot. I gave him a trail name. Diputs. I told him it was the name of a great Cherokee hunter who was so fast that he could snare a leaping rabbit in full sprint with his own hands. You think he's figured it out yet? That it spells stupid, backwards? Not a chance. The snow is still falling on the mountain when the sun, in the distance, starts to rise above the gap, spreading a brilliant light over the pure white snow in the valley, a golden shine that accentuates beautifully the dark shapes of the bare trees on the slopes in front of the building. Billy sits next to the fireplace, sipping on coffee, now writing in his old, tattered leather journal. What is he writing? Except for that one page he tore out to give me long ago, I don't know, and I never have asked him. Maybe someday. Around 8.15, the staff starts coming in. Buddy, not to be confused with Jensen's husband, Buddy Crossman, as usual is first, and he stumbles through the door, quickly slamming it behind him as if to push the cold away, and immediately shouts into the hollow air of the store in his harsh, barking Jersey voice. Those damn Floridians have no clue how to drive in this crap. Buddy retired to the North Georgia mountains from New Jersey on his way to Florida. He decided that his passion for fly fishing and mountain air suited his lifestyle better than shuffleboard, tennis or golf. Short, bald, stout, older than I, and always in his photosensitive eyewear, Buddy can be gruff and caustic, and his Jersey accent only adds to the pungency of his attitude. But the greater part of it is bluff and bluster, sound and fury. At heart, he's a gentle guy who loves fishing, animals, and his wife, Linda. One night, he rolled his car off the mountain, swerving to avoid hitting a bear on an isolate road. For some days after the accident, Buddy didn't know whether Linda would make it. That temporarily put a halt to his tough guy routine, but Linda got better. And Buddy stayed better, but he still shows touches of his original Jersey sarcasm. Florida, I say. Oh crap, we got snow. You know what that means, Buddy. Yep, every Floridian within 300 miles is going to be heading our way to make a snowball. Billy looks up, shakes his head and smiles. Buddy groans at his own joke and then starts to laugh. I follow his lead. It's a Saturday, 24 degrees, the sun is coming out, 60 or more northbound hikers are headed our way and hundreds of tourists are en route by car to plan the snow. The perfect storm at the perfect crossroads on a perfect day.